are so thrilled that you guys are giving up a little more than an hour of your time to learn some new things and hopefully um, ask some good, good questions so we can all learn. The thing about real estate is it's constantly, constantly changing from minute to minute, um, especially with the law. Our Florida is the largest group of condos in, in the country. So our Florida condo law, and I'm sure Mr. Hale will um, say yes with that, is we're, the, we're really the forefront of any kind of condo law that goes on. So you're very fortunate in being able to be at the forefront of selling condos. And I pulled up some numbers, which I thought was really kind of interesting. Just condos, and I'm not even talking about villas. Um, there are currently over 4,000 condos available for sale just in our MLS alone. We've had over 5,000 closings this year of condos, and, there, and there's 250, 2,500 just in the last 90 days under contract. That is like freaking crazy. Um, so, you re so there's a great opportunity there to make a lot of money. There's also a great opportunity to make a lot of mistakes and get into a lot of legal trouble, and hence the reason for our panel today. We want to make sure that you are, not, you are forearmed and forewarned, and you can share that information with your customers so that the deals can go smooth, you can close, you can get your money and not get sued at the end of the day. Because as my favorite line is, I don't look good in orange and I don't look good in horizontal stripes. Um, so we're, we're gonna cover four different parts. Um, I'm gonna speak first from a broker's perspective on some things, and I'm sure that everybody's gonna weigh in on stuff I say, especially Ned. <laughs> Um, and then Dawn Zettler is going to talk about um, condos and homeowners associations relating to insurance. And then we've got Ned talking about he's our legal beagle, keeping us all on track. And then Tracy is going to talk about mortgages. I think that's the way I'm doing it. Is that right, Joanna? Okay. And then, and then Tracy's going to cover up the mortgaging portion of condos and homeowners associations. There's always little pitfalls in every single one of those pieces of the puzzle as you're, as you're putting your deal together. Um, so I kind of wanted to go through that. So I've already told you why is it, why condos, right? I mean, there's, they're selling like crazy. They're affordable, but they're really great for those who are downsizing. They're great for first time home buyers. They're great for single people. And for those who have low to moderate incomes, that can be a really good entry into home ownership. So that's one reason you want to do that. HOAs, um, of course, are growing across the country. A lot of people don't want to just be in a subdivision. They like planned communities, some like the safety feature of gates and walls and um, community amenities, such as pools and shuffleboard, um, country clubs, all of those social things with HOAs. So they're growing rapidly across the country as well. Um, as, and as a realtor, you know, you got to know all of these little different things. So hopefully you can eliminate um, any problems before you write the offer. And if you don't have that many problems, then that increases your odds of getting a celebration, as we like to say at Johnson Company Realty. Um, so as we go through that, hopefully we'll give you some good stuff. I'm gonna talk about more about the paperwork, the required forms um, that the buyer is entitled to and should ask for when purchasing. And my lovely little assistant, Joanna, if she can help me out with that. Um, the first form that I wanted to show you real quickly is the condo governance form. We keep, we keep everything from Florida Realtors in our online system, so you can access that. Um, for those of you who are with other companies, it's all on Florida Realtors in form simplicity, and your broker may, have, may already have it in whatever system you're using as well. So these are really important things. The condo governance form is something most Realtors are not even familiar with. Um, this summarizes the makeup of the condominium, how it's ruled, how it's governed, what the responsibilities are of the leadership of the, of the condos, what, what your responsibilities are as an owner of, of the condo. So this is a form that is required for you to give to your buyers when you're working with the buyers. I also encourage you to give it to your sellers when you're listing. A lot of sellers don't understand how condominiums work because you're really buying into a town, a community, a little fiefdom. There's rules and there's kings and... <laughs> and princes and wannabes <laughs> in, in there. Condos can have a lot of different personalities, way more than homeowners associations. So this is a really exciting form. It's huge. Re, you know, as I like to tell, set, tell everybody, something like this, can't you print it up or put it in your phone and when you have a quiet little space to sit somewhere like your bathroom, just take a few moments and read a page or two. 
That's that one. The condo docks, um, which were not, which are not really in there. The condo docks is that stuff. When you think about it, it's that huge, massive stack of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages that they that they gave you when you bought your condo, and you throw it in a drawer or you forget about it. But those condo docks are created when they get ready to build the condo. You have to create the condo corporation first. So that has the declaration of condos. It has all the articles of incorporation, the bylaws and the rules, everything that relate to that condominium. Am I doing good so far, Mr. Hale? Right on the mark. Yes. Um, those are filed and they're recorded in the county in which it's going to be built. The condominium has the responsibility of recording any amendments to that, any additions they make to the documents, any deletions, all of that should be recorded. I say should be because some smaller condominiums run it kind of out of their back pocket and they may forget to put some of those things into the recording documents. Now they get ready to sell it and you've got some issues. Title company pulls these things and they're looking and there could be a rule that said, Oh, you can't sell your, your condo unless you've lived there six years or something. I'm just making something up. And they forgot to record it. Well, now how is everybody supposed to know? The public is not aware of that rule. So make sure that you always get all of the condominium docs. When you list it and they hand you that pile of papers, call your favorite title company and say, can you pull the latest condominium documents, any amendments, anything relating to that condo or the homeowners association so that you have the, the, the correct information on that. Um, one really big piece of paper that you want when you're selling and when you're buying is the most recent financials. This is absolutely huge. You, buyers need to know what their fees are going to be, how those monies are being allocated, if there's any reserves for painting, paving, roof replacement, really anything over $10,000, Florida statutes require that that be included in the financials. You want the most recent up-to-date financials and that is gonna be, that's gonna be required. If you're listing, you need to know that because your lender is gonna ask you some questions about that. Your insurance company may ask you some questions about that and the title company sure is gonna be looking to make sure of the financial stability of that condominium. Um, the other thing we've got in, in our files, uh, Joanna, is um, the frequently asked Q&A, questions and answer form. This is something that Florida really is the, is the leader on, and you can thank Florida Realtors. We pushed the state to require that this question and answer form be updated every single year by the condo associations. This is the best cheat sheet you can have to give you the basic information on selling the condos. Um, it's going to cut and it's all in there. This is a DBPR form, it comes right, fr right from, from Florida State. So there's six questions on there. It must include what the voting rights are in the condo association, what restrictions are there on your right to use your condominium. This is when you're entering into a condominium, this is not, I can do whatever I want with it. I can move, to, I can move 20 college students in my, in my condominium. Well, that might be a problem. Um, so it's gonna tell you what you can do. Can you have a home business in your condo? Maybe that condominium um, does not allow you to do that. In your parking space, are you allowed to put a motorcycle? Can you put your boat in your parking space? Can you put a big four by four truck in there? Those are the things that, that they want to know. They have to update that every single year. Um, do you have to be a member of any other association? This is going to be key when you start doing your financial calculations. Can I afford this unit? You can be in condo, you know, ABC. That condo might be inside a big HOA, a planned community. So now you may have to join the condominium association and a homeowners association. So you've got two sets of rules, regulations. You could possibly have two fees. So you want to know if you have to do that. And then it's going to talk about the voting rights. Um, do you have voting rights in both the condo association and the homeowners association? And how much are those assessments going to be? This is all in this one little cheat sheet. This is like the most important piece of paper that you really always want to get. Um, are there rent or land use fees? Um, some associations may not own all of the land that the amenities are sitting on. So is there 
a land fee that you have to pay? How long is the rent for that for that land? Um, so that that's a really super important thing you want to know. Um, is the condo association or any of those other mandatory associations involved in any court cases over a hundred thousand dollars? Keep in mind, Florida is a very litigious state, and people need to be aware, and this is all for consumer protection, which is what Florida Realtors is all about, protecting private property rights and our consumers. So is the condo, is the homeowners association under a current lawsuit right now? Um, and it could, it could be something like somebody did a slip and fall, and they decided that they're going to sue the whole entire association, you know, for a million gazillion dollars. They have to tell you that so you, as a potential buyer, know what you're getting into because now you're part of a corporation and you could be held legally responsible for those dollars. That's where all of those condominium documents and the, and the condo governance form is going to tell you really what your rights and responsibilities are. I'm going to stop for a second see if anybody has any kind of questions, comments. Oh, I must be doing really great and filling in all the information. Nobody has any questions. This is awesome. I do. Oh, well, of course you do. Okay. Go ahead, Jean. I put it in the chat. Um, who fills out this form? And if it is the admin at the condo association, um, are they allowed to charge a fee? And if so, is that fee capped like the estoppel? Ah, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, on the question and answer form, um, there's no fee attached to that. That's a, that's a legally required form that they need to fill out every year. So, so you can get that just by calling, hopefully, and being nice. We always try with that. Um, that's a really good question. As far as who fills it out, usually the condo association management company will fill it out, but the board of directors has to approve it. Does, is, is that kind of like what you were talking about? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there, and the other part that you probably are more aware of as a realtor are the riders, the HOA rider and the condo rider. Can you pull up the HOA rider real quick? The, there is a huge disparity in rights to the consumer from an HOA to, to the person purchasing a condo. The HOA rider is, is really a disclosure. It basically informs you that you have to be a member of the association and the assessments that are there, the land use fees, rental for, for rec areas, um, any kind of common facilities, if there's any special assessments. The, the statutes require that this disclosure be given. And you'll see it in bold letters on there. It, it's very specific about it. It requires that it be given, but it does not require you to give the documents, the financials. It doesn't require you to give any kind of real information to the consumer. That's not necessarily a great thing in my opinion as, as a broker. Um, the one little catch for it is if you don't give that disclosure as a realtor before or with when you're writing the contract, the buyer has an out. They can cancel within three days prior to closing or three days after receiving the notice. So realtors who are selling in homeowner associations or if you're selling in a condo with an association, get that frickin' form with the contract. You don't want your deal to blow up because you forgot to give them a disclosure, okay? And when you're, list, and when you're in a lister, then put that in your listing packet. You can upload that directly into MLS and you, and you can check that off, you've covered your butt. Now I'm going to segue a little bit and hopefully Mr. Attorney's got his hands over his ears. What I'm going to tell you, we are not attorneys as realtors. We cannot write addendums. We can't write anything. But what I'm going to suggest as a realtor, if you're selling in a homeowners association, take some, cut and paste, borrow the wording from the condo association about the request to get the documents. And we're going to go to that form next, which is the, the condo writer. You're more familiar with that. That's more complicated. It's three pages long and it covers a ton of stuff. And it's all important things that the buyer needs to know. But if we can switch all the way down to the part where it has the condominium documents there, all the way through there, right down in the bottom there, it, oops, I think we just, sorry, in the bottom is the second page. 
Am I reading? I can't see it. So anyway, but it's got it's got on there two little areas to check. Check one, the buyer has received all the documents because the listing agent was really smart and put all the financials and put all the docs and everything in MLS, or you request the documents. And it gives that, and that makes the seller responsible for getting all of that information. I would use that same wording for the requesting the documents for someone who's buying in a homeowners association. I think it, it gives your buyer extra time and it gives them all the information they need to know when they're buying into a homeowners association. It just gives them more information. They're a more informed customer. And that's our job. The more informed they are, the more responsibility they have for making their decisions, right? So this condo writer covers everything. It covers um, rights of uh, first refusal from the condo if they don't like the if they don't like the consumer who wants to who wants to buy it. And I'm not getting into any of the legal pitfalls within that, but it has everything relating to that, any of the fees, any of any of the assessments, all of that kind of stuff. So make sure that if you are a buyer and it's not attached to the MLS, then fill out what you can from the MLS. Have your buyer initial it and send it along with the contract so that the seller provides all that information to you. Um, Florida law does have more teeth in this for the consumer because it's all about protection. So when we talked about requesting those condominium docs and all the financials. They have three days, three days, according to Florida statute, to review all of those condominium documents, the Q&A, the financials, everything relating to the condo. And if they don't like anything in there, they have the right to cancel within that three day period. So you want to make sure that you get those documents and all that information to the buyer as soon as you can. That's why we really like to have it in the MLS so that when the buyer signs that contract, everything, everything starts from that date forward. Now, here's the other little thing. Sometimes people are not as, as good as we are and they don't provide the condo rider. It's a Florida statute. So it's within the law that that consumer has three days to cancel after receiving the documents. So even if somebody's sloppy and the, and the buyer doesn't get that rider, that does not automatically eliminate his rights to cancel the property. Am I saying that correctly, Ned? Yes, if you do not include this condominium rider, more specifically the verbiage, contained in paragraph five of the condo addendum, the buyer by statute can cancel the contract anytime prior to closing. Right there, paragraph five. That's the key verbiage on this addendum. Yeah, so pay lots and lots and lots of attention to that. Um, you wanna make sure that your information is as accurate as possible when you're giving it to them because it talks about parking areas. Um, on the third page, it talks about all these fees that you have to pay and this can trip everybody up because the condo associations love to charge fees. So, oh, there's an application fee. Oh, there's a fee for this document. Oh, there's a fee for a credit and all of that. There's three little lines in there for you to fill out. There may be more fees than, than that. Fill out what you know, um, but also tell them, you know, condo associations and homeowners associations may add additional fees that we're just not aware of. Um, so don't be shooting the messenger if you get there and there's another 150 or there's a or there's an estoppel fee of 250 dollars or something like that we don't want our customers getting mad at us and we want to do as much diligence as we can but we are not perfect and we want to and we want to save our butts that's my job make us all look pretty right no orange and no and no horizontal stripes uh, so I, I think that will kind of cover just this little tiny bit from the realtor standpoint, I mean, selling condos and homeowners association stuff is just massive. And there's a lot of, of details with it, how to work with a condo association, how to work with a homeowners association to get your deal done. But that's like a whole nother workshop. Uh, so I just wanted to give you enough information to get you started and go down there. Our next expert, Don, is gonna talk about the insurance component with that. Um, and that's going to cover a lot of things that we just within the paperwork that we were talking about. So take it away, Dawn. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start with some frequently asked questions about Florida condominium insurance. Um, the first one is what type of policy will I need in order to satisfy uh, my lender's requirements? 
basically what they're going to need is a standard HO6 unit owner's policy. The lender sometimes refers to this as a walls in policy, but basically the insurance term is an HO6 unit owner's policy. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, the next one is my lender is telling me that I need replacement cost coverage on my unit owner's policy. How do I obtain this additional coverage? This is something that I argue with um, lenders about all the time because replacement cost coverage on the structure and the dwelling on the unit owner's policy is automatically included. It's not something that we add or can normally take away. So replacement cost coverage is automatically included unless the policy states otherwise, which is there's a that's a very rare situation. So another thing is, um, how do I know if I have enough coverage on my policy? Basically, your insurance agent is going to ask you a series of questions that will help you establish the proper amount of coverage based on the details of your condo unit. Another thing is um, my lender is telling me that I also need flood insurance as the building is located in a flood zone. How do I obtain this coverage? If flood insurance is required due to the building being located in a special flood hazard area, the association will have this coverage in place for the building and it will meet the requirements of your lender 99% of the time. You can also choose to take out a separate flood insurance policy for any type of coverage that the association doesn't cover, such as personal property, but um, what the association has will satisfy the lender's requirements most of the time. So, and then what the biggest question is that I get is what am I responsible to insure and what is um, the association's responsibility? So I have that in greater detail at the next page. All right, okay. Property coverage. Um, we're going to start with that. I've kind of summarized a little bit of what the association is responsible responsible to ensure and what the unit owner is responsible for. But we'll start at the top. Uh, the building's plumbing, the building slab foundation, the building's electrical or wiring is all the association's responsibility. As you can see there, I have it kind of marked off. Cabinetry and countertops, that's the responsibility of the unit owner. The drywall, bare concrete floors, that's all the association's responsibility. Electrical fixtures on the outside or with beneath the walls is the association's responsibility. Interior electrical fixtures, such as you know, lighting fixtures, um, things of that nature, that's all on the unit owner. Any type of exterior doors or windows, that falls on the association as well. The exterior of the building, um, including the brick, the concrete block, stucco, siding, that's all the association's responsibility to ensure on their property coverage. Floor coverings on the inside, such as carpet, tile, wood, that would be the unit owner's responsibility. Hurricane and shutters, now this is, uh, changes it up a little bit. Hurricane shutters, if the association installs them, then they are their responsibility to ensure on their policy. If the unit owner installs them, then it will fall on the unit owner because they were not installed by the association or as the original construction. Um, this is another one that uh, there's always questions on the HVAC systems. Um, that is in fact the association's responsibility to ensure, however, the unit owner has to maintain it. So if there's any servicing, replacement, things of that nature, that would fall on the unit owner. Personal property, furniture, electronics, appliances, that's all the, uh, the unit owner's responsibility to ensure. Any type of plumbing fixtures on the inside, such as faucet, interior plumbing, that would fall on the unit owner. Now the exterior roof covering, deck, draining, soffit, uh, fascia, that's all under the condo association's insurance. And then the last uh, three items, wall covering and paint on the inside, water heaters, window treatments, that would all fall on the unit owner's um, policy for the, um, for the interior. And then I'm gonna go down and touch on flood coverage a little bit because th this works a little bit differently. 
the association's flood insurance policy ensures the entire building and structure as originally built to either the maximum limit available through the federal flood program, which is 250,000 per unit, or the appraised value, whichever is less. And the name of this policy is the Residential Condominium Building Association Policy, or it's um, more commonly called an RCBAP policy. Now, the association's flood policy does not insure the unit owner's personal property, such as furniture, electronics, clothing, things of that nature, but the unit owner can get a separate policy to cover that exposure if they'd like. And then if the association does not have a flood policy in place, due to the building not being located in a special flood hazard area, the unit owner can elect to purchase their own flood policy in the event of a loss. But this is normally only the case when the building is not in a special flood hazard area. If they are, the association will have adequate coverage. All right, and just some additional information and references. Um, we do have more detailed information in regards to insuring the condominium on our website, we have a brochure. Really quick, I'll just see if I can open that up. Um, let's, you can kind of see what it looks like. Hopefully this is, this is opening it up. It's in a flip book and it just goes into greater detail. It's taking a little while, but we'll see question while that's coming up about sure. flood insurance yes. when, it, when is is too much insurance too much like if you if you are an individual owner and the mm -hmm. condominium has flood insurance on the entire building um is it worth the investment of getting an individual policy like if you're on the second floor of a condo versus being on the first floor of a condo well it depends the with the federal flood program what their manual says is they will not payout for the same coverage on more than one policy. So if the association has building coverage up to the maximum limit of 250,000 and the unit owner also has a policy for that same amount, the condo association's policy is gonna be primary. And once that limit is maxed out, there's really no more to pay because it's, that's the maximum they're gonna pay on that building or unit. So, it, unless the unit owner maybe has a private insurance flood policy from a private insurer, not the federal flood program, they, it, it's not really worth their while to get additional building coverage. But some companies do now offer private flood insurance and you can get additional coverage. It may be beneficial for somebody who's done a lot of upgrades in their unit and has higher end items. Because like I said, the association's policy covers the structure as it was originally built and it does not normally cover upgrades to your unit. So that would be kind of um, a scenario in which you may want to consider private flood insurance if available to you. And, and here's just kind of what the, the brochure looks like, but anybody can follow the link and it's several pages and it goes into greater detail um, to coincide with like the Florida insurance statute. And can that be made, this can be made available to all of our attendees if they email you? Absolutely, and it's on our website too. Um, so they, they can look and there's a lot of other resources we have as well. So yeah, absolutely. Anybody can email me and get information, call me, you know, if they need something that that would be fine. I and put then, the link in the chat for everyone as well. Perfect. Perfect. Great. And then I also have put a link to the Florida condominium insurance statute. Um, that's very helpful if you have questions or concerns as well. Um, and one note I just put on here that the federal flood insurance program does not abide by the statute because it is a federal program. It's not state specific, so they do not follow those guidelines. So just to keep that in mind. So, and then I've also put all of my contact information for any questions or anything of that nature um, on there. And I, we do a lot of condo associations. So we have a lot of information and references on insuring the condominiums. So, Hopefully I can answer any questions that anybody may have as well. I've got more. <laughs> Absolutely, um, go ahead. One of the things that's like in the condo disclosure, they're talking about um, like in high rise condos that have, they have to decide whether they want to put sprinkler systems in um, or retrofit them. How does the insurance industry look at a condominium that may decide not to retrofit? 
Uh, no, are you talking on the association side, kind of, because... I, that... I, well, I guess, and would that affect the individual um, insurance? Because okay, well, it, it doesn't affect the unit owner policy, except for when a credit comes into play. Uh, if, you, if the association installs sprinkler system, then they receive an additional credit. But whether they have them or whether they don't doesn't really affect the unit owner's policy. It may affect the association side. Um, I don't really um, handle that end of it. So if you have any specific questions, I can give it to our commercial department and have them, you know, answer that question. But on the unit owner side, whether they have them or not, doesn't change the eligibility. Okay. So I know we recently had one of our agents um, was dealing with a condominium where they um, decided not to have flood insurance mm -hmm. and that, that created some issues in there. So is there, is there any advice you would, you would give to listing or selling agents about insurance, something that they should some homework that they should be doing when they first get started in their transactions? So are you saying, okay, so you're saying the association does not have a flood insurance policy and but they they sh they are in a special flood hazard area yep okay well the unit owner can take out the policy themselves um i have seen some lenders though not accept it because it's not the rc bath or condominium the residential condominium association policy so um what i've had to do is just kind of explain to them that it's still the same coverage and most of the time i've always had them accept it whether it's in the insured's name or the association level. It just depends on how strict the, the lender is on that topic, so. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Dawn? Thank you for that great resource sure. material. Oh, sure. do you have something? Nope. I see something in the chat, let me see. Okay. Oh. And all, all Dawn's contact information is in their website and all of that. Please, you know, call her up, take her to lunch, or buy her a cup of coffee. Or I'll take you to lunch. Traditional <laughs> coffee day. Um, you know, pick her brain. Have you know? And make sure you have a really strong insurance person in your arsenal, so that if you have customers that have all kinds of questions, because if you're from another state, you may not be aware of what flood insurance is or any of this stuff. Have that customer have a nice little conversation with Dawn. And, and it will eliminate some of their fears and they'll know exactly what they're going to have to pay for on the, you know, other than their condominium fees and, and the purchase price and that kind of stuff. So absolutely utilize Dawn. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So, but now, now, well, we've gone girl, girl. Now we're going to go to boy. We're going, Ned Hale has, it wears many hats. You know, that seems to be a theme here in my world. Um, but Ned wears the attorney hat and he also has ocean title. Am I saying that correctly? Um, so he knows condos and homeowners associations from inside, outside, and he's going to address it more from the title side today. Um, but I'm sure the attorney always bleeds over into everything and we'll have lots of questions for you. So if you would like to take it away, Ned, and talk to us about condos and homeowners associations, we would be very grateful. I can do that. Uh, everybody can hear me? Good stuff. Okay. You know, I, I like to echo what JJ said about Florida being such a leader nationwide in condominiums. Before I even considered moving to Florida in the early 90s, I was in Chicago. I'd be at a gym and everybody was talking about the Florida condominium. And I'm like, wow, I really got to get to know this. And boy, do I know about Florida condominiums because there's so many of them. And, and so let's just talk about a couple of things. What I'd really like to talk about is uh, a lot of you know I've been teaching the, uh, the FAR bar contract for about 20 years now, and I'd like to address some of the questions that have come up while teaching the class and some areas of problems and therefore how to avoid those problems that have come up in my practice with condominiums. Let's first talk about what the heck a condominium is. First of all, a condominium the easiest way to tell if it's a condominium is not necessarily looking at it because remember, some communities are organized as condominiums, but they're detached units. A condominium does not have to have all attached units. There's some communities that are condominiums. You don't own the land, you just own what? The inside of the unit. So the first place you look at is what? The legal description. I can promise you a few things today. But if the legal description reads unit number, apartment number, villa number, whatever, according to the Declaration of Condominium, folks, 
It's a condominium. And it's governed under the condominium statute if the legal description says according to the declaration of condominium. And again, there is no, there is a statute, a major nation leading statute on condominiums in Florida. It's a long one. But keep in mind, folks, raise your hand if you've ever read the villa statute in Florida. How about the coach home statute? How about the townhome statute? Have you ever re read those statutes? No, because there isn't one. There isn't one. These, this business of villas and uh, uh, coach homes and all that, those are builder terms that you folks use when you're selling stuff. Those are almost all organized under the condominium statute. There's no villa statute, coach home statute, townhome statute. Those are cute terms you folks use and builders use. But be sure you distinguish. There is a homeowners association statute. That is a totally separate statute. And as JJ said, depending on which statute applies for your property, you use the condominium addendum for a condominium. And I told you the easiest way to figure out if it's a condominium. If your community is a homeowners association where membership in a homeowners association is mandatory, you would use the condominium, excuse me, you'd use the homeowners association statute. So it's important to understand the difference. Only do you use the homeowners association addendum when membership in a homeowners association is mandatory. And as JJ pointed out, sometimes you've got a condominium that is in a homeowners association as well, in which case, and the condo addendum says this, you would include both addenda. You'd include the condominium association addendum and the homeowners association addendum. So you really need to understand that. I also can't emphasize enough the importance from a legal standpoint of reading that condominium addendum. I've gotten some calls recently on, as JJ said, there's all kinds of good stuff in that condominium addendum, not the least of which is what? Special assessments. I've gotten some calls recently on that. There were special assessments. They weren't disclosed. Who pays them? The addendum addresses all of that. We don't have time to talk about it today. Number two, the most common thing I see that comes up with that addendum is read paragraph 5B of the addendum that JJ had put on the screen of the condo addendum. Remember, very specifically, number one, if you don't include that addendum as part of your contract, right? That addendum that JJ put on the screen, that three page addendum must, must, must be part of your contract when you're selling a condominium. Otherwise, the contract isn't null and void, whatever that term means. No, what that means is the buyer can cancel the contract anytime prior to closing. If you fail to include, I've seen that, I've had to do that once in my career. Years ago, the buyer wanted out of the deal, and I noticed there was no condominium addendum, and we canceled it because we could because of that. Here's another area. Remember specifically what 5B says. It gives those laundry list of documents that the seller must provide at the seller's expense by statute. That's why it's in all caps, because the statute's in caps. What is it? She had it up. I'm not going to put it back on the screen. You have access to that condo addendum, and JJ had it up on the screen. What is it? The deck, the articles, the Q&A, the most recent year-end financial. Remember, there's a three-day right of rescission for the buyer to cancel the contract. When does that three days start? It starts on the day that the buyer receives the last, the last, the last of those documents. That's when your three day right of rescission starts. And it is a three business day right of rescission. Questions I've gotten over the years, can those documents be provided electronically, such as via email? The answer is yes. Can they be provided via a link? And the answer is in my view, yes. And one other if, is if there weren't enough landmines. This comes up, we use the FAR bar primarily in this county, right? Okay, fine. Let me tell you a little landmine that pops up if you use the NABOR contract. You know that contract down those folks in Naples use it? Believe it or not, that NABOR contract says 
that the agent is not able to give those documents. The, the agent is not able to give those documents to the buyer. What, do you, what the heck does that mean? Under the NABOR contract, not the FAR bar that we use here, but if you're ever using NABOR, pay attention to this. Under the NABOR contract, the seller must give those documents directly to the buyer. And JJ uh, chatted me. I said three business days. Does that override the FAR bar? And it does. It overrides the fine print because there is a small, number one, those three business days arise by statute and the statute preempts what the contract says, number one. Number two, there's fine print at the end of the FAR bar that says any addenda, the condominium addendum is an addendum, that conflict with the main paragraph, then the addendum controls. It is three business days, the statute controls, the addendum controls, it is not three calendar days. It is three business days for you to cancel. Here's another thing I saw come up some years ago. Buyers, right? They got a bunch of documents. The seller thought it was all those laundry list of documents. The most recent year in financial, the deck, the articles, yada, yada, all those documents. But then the buyer, the seller thought they'd given them all, but the buyer got cold feet. And the buyer goes and sees an attorney that knew what the heck they were doing. There's a couple of those in town. And the attorney noticed that the buyer had not received the most recent year-end financial as required by statute in the addendum. No, no. Apparently, by error, they got the budget. That is not the same thing. So having a nice, smart attorney that, that knew what they were doing. This wasn't me. I was on the other side, by the way they canceled the contract and they were able to do that. And I told my sellers, what did the kitty say? There's nothing you can do. They can cancel. Why? Because they hadn't received the last of those documents. So I really, you really need to focus on that. Did you get the documents? When did you give them? If you're the seller, it's your expense to give them and the buyer can cancel. Make sure you have all the correct documents. Make sure you write down. It's nice to have a, a buyer's, there's a, a far form that it's a receipt. And in fact, there's even a box to checks for that the buyer received those documents. But guess what? You can't force a buyer to sign a receipt that they got those documents. So you need to really calendar when you sent those documents, sending them to the other agent is just fine under the FAR bar, not under the neighbor. seller has to give them directly and you're fine, but the buyer can cancel any time. Other areas where I've seen problems, then I'll open it to questions, is part, things like parking spaces. You know, some of these things can be very, very tricky. There is, there is part of that condo addendum that talks about a parking space if there's a parking space that goes with the unit, put it down here. But you really need to make sure, is that just traditionally been your parking space or does the condominium declaration say it actually goes with the unit? Because I have seen fights over that. Boat slips as well. I've seen fights over boat slips. If you are buying a unit, a condominium unit, you need to make sure you, it's your job as the buyer's agent to make sure you and your buyer understand what goes with the unit. And is it just tradition? Is it just political connections that the old owner had? There's all kinds of stuff like that that goes on. Favorite, favoritism towards certain unit owners, uh, you know, they don't like, uh, the, the powers that be don't like another unit owner. That can be a problem sometimes. I've seen petty fights like that. If there is a boat slip that you expect to go with the unit, then you go and get proof with that. In some, let me say, you know, the courts, uh, I saw a court opinion years ago, and it said, you know, the condominium concept is not for everybody. What we really have, and these are the court's words, a little democratic sub-society. And it's exactly right, as JJ pointed out. It's a little city within a city. And sometimes I joke around when I teach the far bar and I say, raise your hand if you believe in limited government. You like limited government. When you hear a politician say you like limited government, 
Do you like limited government? You raise your hand. And more than half the class in this primarily Republican registered county, I might add, more than half the class usually raises their hand. And then I say to them flatly, then I think you really need to think about whether or not you want to buy a condo because you're buying into more government per se. You're buying into more rules and those rules can protect you and they can also enslave you. So you need to be real careful about whether or not a condo is for you. And then one other thing, if you took my condo class and JJ did first ever, we talked about all the benefits of condos, excuse me, not my homestead rather. If you took my homestead class, JJ was there, uh, that I taught for the first time the other day, talking about all the benefits of homestead. The good news is condos qualify for homestead. So I'll open it up to questions. That's just kind of my, uh, my uh, initial uh, comments. It's not, they're not for everybody, but for some people, they wouldn't have it any other way. I have a question about that. When you were talking before about parking spaces and the issues that raises up, mm -hmm. where your attorney's hat now for a few moments, we have so many waterfront condos yeah. that have um, boat dockage, yeah. boat slips, permission. I mean, it's a whole quagmire and I don't, and I don't see that Florida Realtors has addressed it in the condominium addendum or anything like that. Can you maybe share some guidance to the Realtors um, something to watch out for, what they should or shouldn't do. To yeah, it, 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 what they should do is a very novel thing that my mother told me to do in high school. She said, Ned, do your damn homework. That's what you need to do. You need to go and look at the condo docs and ask the management company and ask the president, I need to see proof in these documents what boat slip goes with this unit. Can that be taken away? Okay. I'm dealing, I'm representing a client with a really big fight over boat slips. So your question is a valid one. And there was all kinds of little corrupt games going on behind the scenes about being in line for, because certain boat slips were coveted and there was supposed to be a line you'd get on a waiting list and there were some games going on. And this is kind of the, some of the nonsense that can go on. So JJ, the addendum should address boat slips agreed. Uh, you've got some wealthy people that buy some of these expensive units with expensive boats and they take those boat slips very, very seriously and they've got money to sue people. So you need to, especially if a boat slip you think goes with a unit or may not go with a unit, you need to do your homework and at the, dare I say, imagine this, maybe hire right now, maybe hire a lawyer to assist you to ensure that you are conf that you that this boat slip goes with this unit, it can save a lot of trouble later on. You really, really have to look into it. I wish Brokers there was a simpler advice. answer. There's not a simpler answer, JJ. Just like my mother yeah. said, do your homework. Like that. When you do your homework, you know, uh, verbal is not going to work. Text no is not going to work. Get the, get that person who's telling you something. Put their signature on it. Get it in writing so you have protection for yourself and for your customer because as ned said people like to sue and they look for the people who have you know insurance and deep pockets and it always comes back to the realtor it's always our fault no matter what so yeah because because you guys made five six seven eight nine ten grand and so you all must be rich so we're gonna sue you exactly that's it and my job is to make sure risk management that's what all that's why ned's here that's why john's here is to help you guys stay out of trouble um, and thank you very much um, remember Ned has a title company and he is an attorney so he can he can service you in both those different areas it's always good to have those strategic partners so thank you very much for your many years of contributing to the Royal Palm Coast as well we appreciate it um, now we're going to round it out with mortgages because not everybody has buckets of cash or those who have buckets of cash don't necessarily like to spend it they, they would rather leverage their funds, and that's where Tracy comes in. And, and um, a little bit of background on her, Tracy's been doing this for over 20 years. She's, all, she's part of Women's Council, a huge strategic partner in the Royal Palm Coast Realtor Association. She's also a major investor in RPAC, which is our political action committee to, to again, it's, pro, it's promoting and protecting private property rights. We're not red, we're not blue, we are purple because we're all about protecting the consumer. So that little commercial said, I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy and she's gonna talk about 
mortgages and lots of money. We love women with money, Tracy. <laughs> for that introduction. 31 years this year I've been doing mortgages. 1989, I was 10. <laughs> um, we are getting into the fun part, financing. So if you are going to take a listing and it's a condominium, don't you think that it would be uh, best if you knew what kind of financing people put a contract in on that, right? All right, so that's what we're gonna get into. So can you see my um, share, my screen? Yeah, okay. All right, so the first thing I did was I gave you the link to the FHA approved condos, the VA approved condos, and the Fannie Mae approved condos. So when you take a listing or you have a buyer and you're going to look at a property because you don't know if the listing agent did their job, uh, which I can tell you, uh, never mind. Anyway, so next thing you know, you're, I have a buyer, they're pre-approved, they're gonna put an offer on this condominium. And uh, first thing my agent asked me is like, I'm like, get a copy of the budget. Why do you want a copy of the budget? Well, because the budget's gonna dictate what kind of financing we're gonna go off of right away. There's, when Fannie Mae has two kinds of financing, okay? Um, there's two ways to finance a condo. It's, it's a full review and it's a limited review, okay? So now if I get a copy of the budget and I see that there's 10% reserves of the approved budget, um, I had one the other day, it was $114,000 on the 2020 approved budget and the reserves was 50,000. So it was great, no problem. That's perfect. First thing is we know that we can do a full review on it, okay? Um, full review, uh, a full review does entail a few other things and we're gonna get into that later. So we can do a full review on it. So we can do financing. If you look on the left-hand side, of 97%, so 3% down with the full review. So next thing you know, we get the budget, it's approved, we move forward, then we get a condo questionnaire filled out. We look at that condo questionnaire to make sure that um, one person doesn't own more than a percentage of units that they should for an investor review. So we just make sure that the condo is able to be approved, Fannie Mae, as well as the buyer, okay? Um, then, I say I have another condominium I got, and guess what? They don't have 10% reserves, not even adding back any of the utilities. So that dictates right off the bat which way I'm going to go with them. So if they're purchasing the property's primary residence, then they're going to have to put down at least 25%, because then that will trigger what we call a limited review. And it won't ask questions about the budget. And the condo questionnaire that we have filled out is just a small one. So those are the two things that dictate, you know, which way we're gonna go. So let's do, so if somebody's purchasing a property and they wanna do a full review, we can lend them up to 97%. If they wanna buy a second home and there's 10% reserves in the budget, then we can do 90% on a second home. On an investment property with full review, we can do up to 85%, okay? Now, if there's not 10% reserves, we know right away off the bat that we're going to have to do an owner occupied at least 25% down. And if we wanted to buy it as a second home, we have to do 30% down. And as an investment, we have to do 30% down. And that would trigger a limited review where it would get around the questions that we don't want to answer. Um, uh, things you want to request when you have a buyer or seller for a condo. You want the HOA docs, you want to copy the current budget, uh, management contact information, and then of course the pet restrictions. That's the one thing. Now, FHA is, is doing single unit approvals now. So they will lend on a single unit if we can get a full review done. They won't do a limited review, FHA. FHA is a full review. Uh, one of the other things that's really important, I heard um, Dawn talking about earlier, flood insurance, okay? If your condominium does not have flood insurance, don't try to take it Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, okay? We just, we had one, we tried to go, we're gonna talk about this a little bit. It's, Freddie Mac now does what's um, called um, condo waiver. So you can apply after you have all of your information to Freddie Mac and ask them to review the condo and give you a, um, a one-time waiver on not having enough in the budget or one person owning more than uh, the percentage of condos that they should. I actually got a condo waiver approved on that, but we had a loan, it was Fannie Mae, the condo association did not carry flood insurance. My guy says, I'll get my own flood insurance. Fannie Mae said no, went to the top. So then we applied for a waiver through Freddie Mac, we thought for sure, because they do a lot of waivers on stuff that I, I wouldn't do a waiver on. So sure enough, they said no. So Fannie Mae 
you need to ask that question when you're going to take a listing as well, because then you're going to know that they either have to get a portfolio loan or they got to pay cash. So, um, and then also VA only does the, the uh, condos if it's on their approved list. All right, next, um, I'm going to the condo review flyer. I know everybody is dying to know what those condo questionnaires are asking. So here it is. I got it in writing. The, they want to know about the common areas being complete. 90% of the units are sold and closed. Developers transferred control of the HOA to the unit owners. Unit owners 60 days or more past due must be less than 15%. Projects in which single entities own more, like so one person owns, if there's, let's just say there's 12 units and this came up once. And this person owned three units in there. Well, guess what? We got a Freddie Mac, we, we did get a, a uh, condo waiver for Freddie Mac on that, by the way. But who knows, they might not have been in a good mood that day or the next day. They always try to get your condo waivers to the Freddie Mac underwriters on a Friday because that's when they're the happiest. That's when they're more likely going to give you an answer for yes, just off the top. Sorry, my, my opinion. Um, investor concentration does not exceed 5% or 50%. So when they ask you how many people rent, you know, or how many, what is your percentage of rental? So if I have one unit and there's a hundred units in there and it's more like, we'll say like apartment, it seems like, but so there's 60%, 60, let's say the percentage is 60 people. So 60 units rent in those hundred. If you're purchasing it as a primary or a secondary, that's okay now. The investor concentration has gone away. That only applies now to investment properties. So if you're purchasing that unit as an investment property and there's 60% of the people in there already invest, you're not going to be able to buy it as an investment. You better do it as a second home or move into it and make it your primary. All right. Budget must least have at least 10% in reserve. This is always the first thing you get when you go to a listing. First thing you get is the budget. Put that in your head. Budget, budget, budget. And you can always send it. You know what? I must get two or three a day people send me. They're like, I'm going to take this listing. How's this budget look? It takes two seconds. Two seconds. Okay. And then of course, like commercial space and mixed use allocation is limited to 25%. So like the Cape Harbor condos, you know how the commercial stuff they have downstairs, it's less than 25%. So that is, um, uh, that's a full, those condos are good for full reviews. Then other important notes for condos, which are not allowed, it's just that this is all simple. They can't be like condo tells like the pink shell. Um, they have to have mentor membership fees. HOA can not an, operate as a restaurant or a health spa. I had a I had a uh, underwriter once Google tarpon landings when I was doing a condo in there. He was a new underwriter. He didn't last long. He kind of he told he was like trying to tell me that it was a condo tell because the Westin was down the street. I got that one approved, and he he's not around anymore. Um, HOA cannot own an op all right. So HOA, if they have a litigation going on, there's Paseo condos in there. I know that there's some litigation going on back there where the, um, the association or the owners are suing the stock development. So I had, um, an agent call me up and say, you know, can they not get this approved? for a mortgage and I said, no, they cannot. And she asked me why not? And I'll say, oh, let me, let me give it to you simply. If they're in a lawsuit and they, and the, and the, oh, the homeowners lose and they have to pay a special fee of say $20,000 and they divide it up between all the owners, is that an additional expense? Yes. Does that affect their debt to income ratios? Yes. That is why that is a problem. Does that make sense? That's for Fannie Mae. All right, no co-ops or manufactured homes, um, no projects that operate as a continued care com community. Everybody knows that. Um, and split ownership arrangements, timeshares are not allowed. Okay, and last, there is our condominium waiver. This is the condo, this is exciting news for the condo buyers. Freddie Mac will allow for a waiver for delinquent assessments, like if the percentage is more than 15% of the 60, Excessive commercial space. So if you have 30% commercial space instead of 25, you can apply. Pending litigation, meaning it's one homeowner doing something with another, I don't know, nothing big. It can't be, the litigation has to be very small. Um, project occupancy uh, for investment property. So if the percentage of um, investors is larger and they wanna apply, they can for an investment property. They'll allow you to apply for even on investment properties. 
And then of course the budget reserves, if there's not 10% reserves, if you want to go through the whole entire process and cross your fingers and hope that uh, Freddie Mac will say yes, um, then you can do that. I mean, if it was a close call, yes. And then a single entity ownership, meaning if one person owned, I, I had the one guy that owned three units in a 12 unit complex and they didn't have budget reserves and we got that approved on a waiver <laughs> for both. So who knows, depends on the day you send it in if the underwriter's in a good mood. Um, and then there's a link for that um, if you have any questions. And that is my shortened condo class. Does anybody have any questions? I know everybody's probably asleep. I think that's very helpful. You opened up a whole bunch of other questions when you're looking at that and Crystal's got one. Um, can we have those links to be able to look at which financing are, are available or maybe even your presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I have a bunch of stuff on, on a, 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 my condo class is a lot longer. I just kind of shortened it. So no, that was super. That's it. You see, we've all kind of just scratched the surface of, of every topic. Condos and homeowners associations are our mass, our massive business in Florida and it makes everyone a lot of money, but there's also potential to cause a lot of a lot of problems as well. So all of these people might be able to do classes in the future and expand out and give more detail on that. But if you need to know something real quick, because season, season is coming up, um, go, like I said, call them, meet with them, find out what you need to do. And I mean, we didn't even talk about the personalities of, of, home, of homeowner association management companies or condo association management companies. That's a whole nother just game in itself is how you navigate your way. You know, how do you get through the gate? How do you get through the security guard? How do you, how do you get to those lovely people? And I'm sure Tracy's got a story. I mean, well, what I was going to say is how much more of a professional does it make you look when you walk in for a listing presentation and say, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, I'm also going to make sure that this condo is going to qualify for our buyers to do the type of financing that they are telling us that they're applying for. Exactly. Right? You were reading my little, my, my little closing notes. Thank you. But yeah, but you've got to remember, you also have to treat all of those people that can make or break your deal with respect because those associations and the board of directors can just kill everything. They'll figure out a way to mess it all up. Um, you know, so don't sneak in or anything like that. Um, Joanne and I went to a, a condominium project. We were, we were looking at, at the amenities, you know, we're just kind of semi sneaking around and uh, there was absolutely nobody at the pool. And we were wondering, you know, this is kind of weird. And then all of a sudden the girls from the, from the association office are running out after us. We thought, oh shoot, we're going to get into big trouble, you know, now. Turned out there was a bear <laughs> that had been in the pool area. <laughs> so they're like, oh, you better get the heck out of here. You know, so be careful when you sneak around in condo and home yeah. office. <laughs> you never know what you're going to find. Um, I did want to ask Ned one little quick question before we wrap it up. Um, when we're talking from a, from a title standpoint, um, I know the dirty word estoppel. I think agents get a, very confused about what estoppel is, who is asking for it, who's required to pay, how much can the condo or the association management companies charge? Is there a cap for that? Can you just kind of address that like real quick for us? There is. Um... An estoppel letter is a letter indicating what the status is of the association fees. And in my humble opinion, and I'm not known for my humility, but in my humble opinion, I don't think they should charge for it at all. That's like a bank charging to ask you to tell you what your freaking bank balance is. But they do. And they were getting, they were getting really, out, the fees were getting really out of control. So a few years ago, the, enough people complained, the legislature acted, and they said that we're going to cap the estoppel fee per association to $250 per estoppel letter if the, if the owner is not uh, delinquent. They have allowed by statute another $100 for an ex expedited estoppel letter, which is an, a letter that uh, means you get it within three business days. And they've added also another fee that's allowable that is a, if they, if they are delinquent, you can charge another 150. So the maximum they could ever charge would be 500, but that's only if number one, they're delinquent, the owner's delinquent, number two, that the, um, you want it expedited. By contract, not by law, by contract, the seller pays for the estoppel fees. That's the standard verbiage in the contract, but that's totally negotiable. And then by contract, not by law, there's also these dreaded, 
And that's the other thing to pay attention with that I don't think anyone's really mentioned, application fees for a buyer and the dreaded capital contribution fees by a buyer, which can be significant into the thousands I've seen. Just try West Bay down in Estero. I think that's several thousand dollars. So those by contract, not by law, the buyer pays those. But part of your homework is to get a clear idea of the laundry list of fees that the association is going to charge for various things. The biggest one, again, I've seen is the um, uh, capital contribution. But nobody also mentioned, what about application? Remember, most, most condos, not most uh, homeowners associations, but most condos require a buyer to be approved by the association in writing and a title company will require that. I don't think that should be legal. I think that that gives them too much of an opportunity to start engaging in housing discrimination. But it's the law and they, I've seen them, uh, I have seen with my own eyes, I've seen they're not required to give a, a, a reason why they reject a buyer, number one. Number two, I've seen it though not recently and for reasons I believe to be discriminatory, which is outrageous. The point is, this is where we are right now. Buying or selling a condo is a major undertaking and, and, and buyers and sellers are looking to you folks for your expertise to help them. And it's your job to have that expertise. I just got one, one thing. Uh, when I'm looking, uh, everybody knows I'm allergic to condos, okay? I, you know, it's like, <laughs> but anyway, I, I do them anyway, you know, to a small percent. What baffles me is the amount of misinformation in the MLS. Like, I'm try, let's say I'm trying to find a condo, they need a loan and they have a little dog, whatever. Uh, just to go through that and how many people have the misinformation about the pet fees, about the, right. all the fees, about the condo, whatever, you know, and they, like, they don't care. And, you know, the answer is like, well, you know, call up the association and get that information. And that's not my responsibility. That's supposed to be the seller's agents. Responsibility. Agreed. Agreed. And you're, I, I agree with you. And, and, and nobody's really mentioned either. The two biggest areas of problem in a condominium, and I was going to mention that I didn't, is what are the pet restrictions, if any? What are the pet fees, if any? And what are the restrictions on rentals? Because those can really have a major impact. And keep in mind this whole baloney about this emotional support animals where people were having emotional support peacocks and emotional support pot belly pigs and to, to skirt pet rules. That law has changed in Florida and we could teach another class, JJ, we ought to, on, uh, on what are the new emotional support rules and they've really tightened up a lot of those bogus abuses. Oh, yeah. Certified by Florida Realtors to teach on service animals, and, everything. and that is a huge passion. But those those bring up some good things, and I think what everybody is saying is, well, condominiums are a massive part of our business, and if you don't like them, refer them to someone who loves them. But you really have to do your homework, understand what condominium sales are all about, take as many classes as you can, because each state is different. So you might have a buyer coming from Colorado or from New York where there's a co-op. You know, or like we were talking about boat slips, those could be votaminiums. I mean, lots of things fall under Florida Statute 718 and, and that kind of stuff. So right, right. know your stuff, take as many classes as you can, get your strategic partners, get your whole team together because you aren't expected to know everything as a realtor, but you're expected to know where to get that information. We operate as transaction brokers in the state of Florida, but that does not give you the um, excuse to be sloppy and unprofessional and just say, go call this person and go call that person. If you want to succeed and be um, in the top 5% of the real estate industry, and there's over 7,000 members just in the Royal Palm Coast Association, there's the same amount over in Nabor. And then we've got Benita Stero and Sanibel and Marco. And, you know, you go on and on and on. And you, you run, you know, you go to the grocery store and you've tripped over five realtors while you're, while you're getting coffee, right? Um, so if you want to be in the top, get your homework, do your homework done, include that kind of stuff in your marketing. It's really super important to do that. Um, so take these, take these ladies and gentlemen out, give them a call, go pick their brain and use them for your business when you're doing it. Um, 
put, get everything in writing. That's the, that's the biggest thing. I always want to tell everybody, you know, no matter what, if you have a conversation on the phone, follow it up with an email just to confirm our conversation. You know, please confirm this is what you told me. You know, you told me that there was a $250 estoppel fee, period. Make sure that you've got it. Cover your butts just in case there's ever any trouble. And it smooths out the whole process. I mean, the market is fast and people come down, they want to close within 30 days if they possibly can, which could be a problem with some condo associations because how long does it take for them to get approved by the association, which we talked about the whole legal discrimination, fair housing, that kind of thing. But you have to know what the little game plan is because if you've got a guy who's packing up his house in New York, he's coming down with a moving van, and oh my God, five days before your closing that you put on the contract, the condo association hasn't approved your guy, you have got a mess and a half. And yeah. guess who's gonna be paying for hotel rooms and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. And our goal is to make everybody's real estate experience a wonderful, warm, exciting one so that they will refer business to, to you and you can be in this business for a very long time, not be afraid to go anywhere and have a great reputation. You know, so get all that stuff together. But the most important thing is to have fun, enjoy this wonderful experience because you're making a lot of differences in a lot of people's lives. And, and you can be the one who's the go-to person. You can be the condo queen or the, or the homeowner king. So I think without further ado, I think that's the end of it. We've recorded it. If you'd like any of the documentation and you don't get it, or you just want to review this again and you can't find it, just call, just call us and we will make sure you get all the links to it. Our job as realtors is to work together. We're all in the same business. And we don't want to create adversarial relationships. We all want to work together and make it a tremendous working career. So you all have a wonderful, wonderful, hopefully dry day. The rain just stopped at our office. So have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.